Hey everybody, Stephen Joe here, back with uh, another book from the uh, African Writers series by Heinemann, uh, AfricanWriters.com. Anyway, I've been enjoying, I've read a few of these books, I've been enjoying them. This one is called The House of Hunger. Now, <laughs> I'm going to butcher this name. Ah, uh, unfortunately, I, I wish I, I, I wouldn't, but I'm going to. But, uh, Dambuzo Morechera. I'm sure I butchered that. My deepest apologies to him. But, uh, but that's the best. You can see it here. That's about the best I can do. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. So, in case you haven't seen one of my videos before, if this is your first time watching my videos, then, uh, much thanks for checking it out. And, uh, I hope that, uh, that you'll enjoy this video. But I have to give a warning. Uh, my videos contain opinions that may be different than your own. And if you can't handle that, then please don't watch it. There's lots of videos on YouTube you can go watch. Uh, this video is about role-playing games. I read books, and then I think about them and how I could use things I've learned in them uh, in, a, in an RPG game. I view RPG games as a canvas on which the DM and the players can create art through a means of gaming. And the purpose of art, in my opinion, is to explore and understand the world. So that is what I do when I play RPG games. RPG games for me are not merely entertainment, or they are entertainment, but I find ideas, exploration of ideas, I find art very interesting. If you're afraid of art, or you don't think that that sort of thing uh, should be in video games, or, sorry, in role-playing games, and if you think that that sort of thing shouldn't be in politics, for example, shouldn't be in games, then this really isn't, you probably shouldn't follow me, you shouldn't probably listen to my videos, you're not going to like them. Uh, this isn't, uh, you know, my games, my games aren't of that sort. My games strive to, uh, strive to explore the world. And uh, one of the ways that I do that is that when I read books and so forth, I make notes and then I, you know, try and use things, explore ideas and whatever in my games with, with that. And, uh, and I know that a great many people don't like that in their games. A uh, great many people are actually afraid of art. And that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I, I teach their own, and that's great. And But please don't watch the video. You're not going to find it interesting. You might as well go watch something something else. Okay, thank you. And and But if that does sound like something interesting to you, if you do like new ideas, and you do like exploring the world, and you think doing that through gaming might be fun and I highly advise that you only ever try that when you're playing with very good friends, not with acquaintances, not with people you've only met, you know, for a short time online, that sort of thing, but very good friends. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you might be in a lot of trouble. Just a lot of people. You know, you need to know, you need to know your friends well enough to know what sort of boundaries they'll put up with, what kind of things they can handle. And you also need your friends to trust you as a GM, to trust the process, what you're doing, you know, and the exploration that you're making. So, uh, with that said, I'm going to get right into this. This is The House of Hunger. I love this book. It's really neat. It's, uh, it's, it's well written. And I enjoyed the writing style. Uh, I did find that it had too many sort of literary references in it that I didn't like, sort of hammering hammering me over the head with it. I don't like that sort of thing. I prefer references to be sort of more ambiguous, something that I have to ferret out for myself, you know. Uh, I've read enough books that I can catch things. Oh, hey, that's from this, that's from that. I don't really need it pointed out to me. But the author, that's their style, I suppose, and that's, that's how they wanted to write it, and that's fine. Just personally, I don't really, I don't really like that style too much unless it's a non-fiction book but in fiction i like it if it's sort of more opaque 
Uh, but other than that, it was a it was a great book. I very much enjoyed it. It very much took me away to a different place. That's something I I enjoy about fiction. When I do read fiction, I don't read a lot of fiction. I try for about a 50-50 mix these days. Uh, but for the past maybe 20 years, I've only read nonfiction. Prior to that, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy in my, you know, when I was uh, in my 20s. I read a lot of it. I don't like that stuff anymore. Uh, it's not particularly well written. The stories aren't particularly good. So I, I tend to move more towards this sort of thing. I find it a lot more interesting. That's now. I mean, in my 20s, of course, I was fascinated by the stories. I thought they were great. But, you know, I mean, in your 20s, when you're doing that, you're sort of learning how to read, you know. And, uh, and so, but once that process is over, then, yeah. <laughs> or at least for me, anyway, it was time to move on. And that's what I did. So here I am. Uh, so I'm just going to get started here. I'll just go right into this book. It's very violent. Uh, a lot of sex, a lot of violence and sex in it. You know, it's uh, it's not for it's not for the faint of heart. I'll tell you that much. So, you know, that's that's a warning if you decide that you want to read this book. It's it's pretty brutal, and that brutalness is something that I would bring into a game. And I do bring that into my games, as a matter of fact. But this book sort of brings home just how brutal even a a uh, a fight that doesn't even involve weapons and arms uh, can can uh, can be. How it can totally destroy a person's life. Even just a fist fight can completely destroy a person's life, especially if you don't have you know modern day medicine, which which you know. Uh, in this book, there there wasn't a, a lot of medical help there for people, so you know that that compounds the injuries, and you know that got me to thinking. In this day and age, we don't really understand that uh, because we do have modern health. So you know, a fist fight or whatever, you can go get stitched up. They can reset bones fairly easily. Your your odds of dying from say infection or something is relatively low. But if you don't have that, then just a simple fist fight can actually leave you completely devastated. Your teeth get knocked out. There's no way to replace them, for example. Bones get broken. They aren't set properly, so they leave you with a limp. Uh, your face gets busted up. There's no reconstructive surgery or anything. So I think in a lot of ways, from the violence that would be in the Middle Ages, I think that role-playing games are pretty heavily sanitized from that. And this book really woke me up to that. Now, I was always aware of it before, but but this book just, it's its so brutal, some of the descriptions of its, its fights and stuff, that, uh, uh, that it really hammered that home for me. So uh, so that was something I really appreciated about it. And I'll, I'll give you an example, like on uh, page 82 here. Ah... Uh, most of his front teeth had gone and his jaw seemed to be hanging on by a thread. Great scabs of blood were forming all over his eyes, nose, mouth, and cheeks. And then at the end of this fight, he gained the nickname of Warthog Face because his face had been so rearranged and his, his physical aspects had been so devastated by this simple fist fight. But, you know, it, albeit he picked a fight with somebody much larger than him. But, I mean, that happens, right? That's A bully's usually much larger than you, right? So, you know, he wasn't put together. He wasn't put back together properly. And I think you would see a lot of that, say, in a fantasy world in the Middle Ages or so forth. You could get around it, of course, if there was a lot of magic in your world. If, if magic healing at the local temple were very easy, then I suppose they would probably have a much different attitudes, attitude towards violence than, uh, say people would in the Middle Ages. You know, but here, violence is really a thing to be avoided. And I think in our sanitized society, you see a lot of people cosplaying violence these days, uh, out in the streets and so forth, like, almost like violence is a, is a game or something. And it really isn't. And this book really hammers that home, how, how badly it's not a, it's not a game. And I think that's something I would I would definitely bring into my games a little more because of reading this book, you know. 
uh, I, I think that I think that some kind of a uh, or, or just maybe even just a campaign world some kind of a just 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 for if if the group had the stomach for it and was interested in it sort of a down and gritty realistic kind of a grindcore RPG game maybe have you know more critical hits and stuff uh, going back to arms long claw long using the critical wound system in there say for roll 20 I did a video on that I think that that would be you know for example a great a great way of incorporating that so now that, uh, so some of the terms I ran into like for example uh, it talks about soul hunger and I just that got my imagination going soul hunger Imagine that as a a game mechanic. Yeah, you could base a whole game on that. Having heroes with a soul hunger or battling creatures with soul hunger that actually you have a a numeric value that uh, that quantifies their hunger and that they have to satiate. So the players either have that hunger themselves or they have to hunt creatures that have that hunger absolutely love that idea and that that uh, you know I, I just it's just a term that he came up with in the book and I just thought it was really neat another thing I thought was interesting was this uh, this drug daga uh, everybody seems to be chewing I've run into it the I, this is this was the first time I'd heard of daga but I've since watched a lot of, uh, of documentaries about Africa and so forth found it absolutely fascinating in particular uh, world's dangerous roads for example and uh, I thought that that was the Daga was interesting a Daga is something I would love to add into a campaign world a a drug maybe if you if you chewed it you only needed four hours sleep something like that but if you didn't have it then all of a sudden you might need many more hours of sleep say you would sleep for 12 hours a day for a week without it but if you eat it then you only need four hours of sleep a night something like that not that that that's how daga actually works i have no clue how daga works but it just is an idea for an rpg game uh another turn of phrase that he used in there that got my imagination going was uh insects of thought what a great idea now of course in the in the book he's talking about uh thoughts as insects that can infect your mind uh, bad ideas, good ideas, whatever, coming from society around you and getting into your brain and sort of burrowing in and nesting in there. But I thought, wouldn't that be an interesting idea as a monster to have like a village that got invaded by these insects that are giving everybody some kind of crazy idea, and so the whole the whole village starts going mad because you know, and that and that's one of the things that about an RPG game, which is really fun, is that you can take sort of esoteric ideas like that like insects of thought and you can make them physical and you can turn them into into an actual physical representation that the players can there uh thereby go and fight and go go and deal with in a physical way but it still investigates the idea it still has fun with the idea because i don't think that the reality of the world and our physical conscious thoughts I don't think that they're so divided as the as we might think they are. Uh, I you know I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that the world in our own minds is a construction of the actual reality around us. So so actual insects getting into your mind and infecting them? Why not? What a wonderful idea! What a wonderful turn of phrase! I really like that. So another another thing he talked about. Now this is kind of brutal. But he, but it's an interesting thing, and that was uh, gorilla bodies during the Civil War being left out for children to see. What a brutal concept! Like that, just is just unbelievable. But of course, it's something that happened in the Middle Ages all the time. It's not. Uh, but again, you know, being in being in the West, I don't really encounter that stuff. Uh, you know, except in literature and so forth. So far, but the way things are getting, who the hell knows? But anyway, I just thought that was really interesting. There's also uh, there's also an aspect in here. Another thing they're talking about is children sort of killing a cat for entertainment. Again, a, liz uh, a level of physical violence that uh, that is hard for me to relate to, but certainly existed in the Middle Ages. For example, uh, people used to put cats in in bags and stuff and let them fight, and you would you and people char they would charge money uh, for people to watch this. 
you know, this was considered a form of entertainment. So Middle Ages was very, very violent. I know you can take some of the most violent cities in the world these days and the crime rate, and you can pretty much double it for just even towns in the Middle Ages. Of course, the Middle Ages is a long period, so, you know, there were periods that were nice and periods that weren't, but, but there were periods that, that were just absolutely brutal. So that's another thing. Uh... So the, the main characters, mom and dad, were violent to him. Uh, it wasn't really, it wasn't really unexpected. Uh, it wasn't considered good or bad. I think it was just a thing. For example, uh, uh, the author talks about how the older generation considered that if you didn't beat your wife, for example, you, you mustn't love her. You, you beat your wife if you love her. So, obviously, I mean, you would think you would beat your children, too, if you loved them, right? So, that's kind of a strange thought to me. I don't know how I would incorporate that into a game. But it could be in the back of my ma mind that a certain society had that kind of thought going on. But certainly, I think that that was something that, that was uh, in Western culture for a long time, took a great deal of time to get rid of and isn't even entirely gone at this point I don't think so another idea I thought was interesting too was a term of phrase was seed of hate which of course is just you know meaning a seed can be planted in the mind it's not it's it it's not that unusual of a term you know it could be insects of hate or insects of thought that are hate or something like that but I thought that that might be an interesting scenario where actual physical seeds could be snuck into an area and planted and then it might be up to the players to go and seek out those those seeds that had been planted. It wouldn't obviously have to be hay, it could be seeds of love or seeds of peace too if you wanted. But it was just the term that got me thinking of that, that that would be an interesting idea or maybe even like there could be spells maybe druids could cast spells on on seeds and if you go and you plant them in a village then this emotional motion will sort of bubble up in the village to overwhelm the villagers or or make the make that the preeminent emotion of the village so players could either use detect magic or they could use some sort of means to to ferret out these seeds or where they've been planted or what plants are causing this that sort of thing that would be really interesting. I think that's one of the aspects of, of role-playing game that always fascinates me is is taking the symbolic and transforming it into the real through, uh, through the canvas of games. And that would be a way of doing that. Uh, another term that got me that I thought was kind of interesting was dead souls have no worries. I just thought that was great. <laughs> uh, beer hall doll which is a prostitute. I thought that was an interesting term. Could definitely use that in a game. Uh, okay, so this is one I really like. This one got me into thinking of all new kind of games and, and uh, campaign worlds and stuff is Dream Hunters. Yeah, it would be fascinating. What a great idea to have actual Dream Hunters. So you could, you, you could be, they could, it could be a group of players that hunt dreams and could make up a whole mechanic for that. I don't know if it would fit into the... Well, you'd have to transform sort of a D20 system. I think that would have to be a whole game itself as the Dream Hunters, you know? But I thought that was a great little phrase or great little term. There was a game. Uh, it was called uh, Shadows... Or no, Shadow Realm or something. This was this was a long time ago. Someone had made a small indie game and it had this table and stuff in it. And it looked really neat. And the game got a lot of hype there for a little while until people realized the mechanics didn't work that well. But it looked really awesome. So something like that would be just amazing for Dream Hunters. I think that's a great idea. Uh, so another aspect of this that I found interesting was the idea of magical realism. And magical realism is where you take a, a fictitious setting but it's realistic in in almost every aspect except maybe one or two aspects, which is just sort of sort of uh, uh, tweaked in a magical way. Magical realism is one of my favorite genres, and this has an area that sort of 
I don't know if it goes into bra into magical realism or if it's a psychotic break. It's very well done, and I very much enjoyed it. And I found myself questioning, is this a psychotic break? Is this magical realism? I couldn't tell. Wonderful bit of writing. Love that part of it. Uh, but anyway, I was thinking that in a, in a game setting, that would be a lot of fun, too, to have something like that. Some kind of, uh, just, just, it's all realistic, maybe even modern age, something like that, but just one little thing tweaked in a magical realistic way, magical realism way. I think that would be really interesting. Uh, something else that was written in here that I thought was really interesting was just a quote. I'm going to quote it. It's, uh, one learns a lot about people by studying what they do not want to know. I like that. I mean, that never, ever occurred to me. But after reading that, I've, I've watched people. And uh, it's absolutely true. People will avoid things they don't want to know, like the plague. It's fascinating, uh, especially for for someone like me, uh, because I tend to gravitate towards danger. If somebody threatens me, if something's challenging, if something's dangerous, I, I just walk towards it. I don't know why. It's, it's not very self-preserving. But I do the same thing with ideas. I will just walk right towards them. I don't know don't know why but I've noticed most people don't seem to do that uh, and, uh, and I found that interesting and learning stuff about people by watching what they avoid very fascinating idea uh, another turn of phrase I liked in this was her painted claws <laughs> I don't know how I would use that in a game I guess it could be like a witch or a mage and with her painted claws I love that maybe painted claws maybe the way uh, someone paints their nails or something could have something to do with the magic spells they could cast. Perhaps it could be a component of spell casting. So the spell caster has to, has to paint his or her, uh, uh, nails to cast spells, right? Uh, uh, and so yeah, I, I just thought that that was an interesting idea too. So one thing, one thing interesting too about this book is that in here now, now this is, this book is... It's a it's a brutal area like it's modern but in a lot of ways it's not modern. So so one of the things I found extremely interesting was police beatings as sort of a punishment. So sort of if you act like a a jerk the police will just come and beat you up, right? They don't necessarily have to drag you off to jail. Now the police are corrupt. But it got me to to thinking, you know, about Rome, because I know that in Rome, oh, what, uh, what were they called? I can't really remember right now. But in Rome, they used to have brigades of people, like literally four or five people that would wander around with clubs. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because it's just, it just seems so absurd to me in modern times. But they would walk through the street looking for wrongdoers, and when they found one, they would just beat the living crap out of them. And that was sort of their idea of police. You know, and I've always used that in my RPG games because I just I just think that's really <laughs> not awesome. But, well, it's awesome in a way because the players players when they do something wrong, they get caught by the police. They're not actually going to lose their lives. They're not actually going to to die. But there is going to be a punishment for their poor behavior. So let's say they pick a fight in a, uh, uh, they come to a new town, they're not very well known, they don't know who to bribe to get out of being punished, they start a fight in a tavern, then they decide they're going to leave that tavern as they leave, there's these toughs with their bats or their whatever they have waiting outside to beat the hell out of them. And they're already beaten up from the bar fight and stuff, so they get a good whipping, or whooping, and, uh, uh, it's, you know, that's a great... <laughs> I love putting that in my campaign world. It's great. Anyway, so this reminded me of that. Uh, so another uh, another thing I really enjoyed was, uh, was the parents being represented as ghosts at one stage. That got me thinking about how... Uh, you know, and this is something in in D and D, which is obviously quite co common. But I was thinking of incorporating it more, sort of in is in sap in ancestral worship, say a class that could call forth their ancestors to get advice and to get powers and stuff. And you could role play them interacting with ancestors and whatever to learn stuff. I thought that would be really interesting. Uh, another thing I found interesting was that women weren't allowed to kill goats. That was fascinating. Why wouldn't you be allowed to kill goats? Well, for some reason, women weren't allowed to kill goats. 
you know, it's it's that sort of thing that makes a makes a culture really fascinating, you know. So uh, 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 there is a there is a section where where the author compares uh, factory farming to the Holocaust, which I thought was sort of in poor taste, or not sort of. I I did think it was in poor taste. Uh, that's my opinion. You might think otherwise. Like I yeah, go to the front of the video, <laughs> listen to my disclaimer. If you have a problem with my opinion, go away. All right, uh, cool spell idea is on. Uh, I found was right here. I'll just read it to you. But before she left, she had drawn a circle in red chalk on the wall by my bed and said. Quote, if the circle begins to bleed and run down the wall, that means I'm in danger. But if it turns blue and breaks up into a cross, then that means I am coming home. What an awesome spell, right? I was thinking that would be great. So so you could have you could have someone just draw a circle on a wall, and then if it bleeds, you know they're in danger. And I, th I think that would be great, even just as a start of an adventure, like the, the circle's on the wall and the adventurers are hired to go rescue somebody, and the person that hires them knows that the person's in danger because the circle is bleeding, and they have some idea of where they went, so the party has to go and search them out. I think that would be just really cool. Anyway, I, I just thought that was awesome. Another thing I thought was really neat... Uh, and it would be an interesting idea for a campaign world, is uh, is that drowned people turn into something called a manfish. And I don't know why, but a manfish is terrifying. People certainly in the book were scared of a manfish. So I was thinking, you know, a person could create something called a manfish, and that that's how they are, are created, is by somebody drowning. And then also, you know, there's the idea also maybe people don't want their relatives being man fish, and so they might hire a, a group of adventurers to go hunt down and kill a man fish because it's not really their relative anymore. It's this monster, and they don't like their relative being a monster, so you have to kill a man fish and release the soul of the relative. Anyway, that was an idea that I thought was kind of neat. And then there's a neat magic item idea too here. I'll just read it uh, again to you. But I bit the silver button and turned myself into a crocodile and laugh, uh, laughed my great sharp teeth into him, or at him. I don't know how to read. But anyway, so I thought that was a really neat idea. A silver button or some kind of something that you can put in your mouth that allow you to transform into something and then you could spit it out to, to uh, transform back again. I just thought that was a neat idea. You know, it could be on a shirt or something. Maybe you could have three, four different kind of buttons and you pull the buttons off. Or perhaps they pop off and you can pop them back on again. Something like that. It was a neat idea at any rate. Uh, so one more thing I learned in here is... is now, I, this is not... This is <laughs> not dietary advice. I don't recommend anybody tries this. I just found this interesting. Please don't do this at home. Uh, if you're inclined to do it at home, then please stop the video and stop watching right now because it's not anything good. But anyway, the idea that you can eat grass if you juice it. So, so during famine, they would eat fried grass. I find that absolutely fascinating. I need to look more into that because... I know that you can't actually eat grass, or if you do try and eat grass, you have to you have to sort of ruminate it, like a sheep would or something. And that is in that you eat the grass, and then you have to throw it up, and then you'd have to eat your throw up. And you might even have to do that a couple times. I'm not sure. And it's because because uh, the cellulose or cellul yeah I think it's called cellulose in the grass doesn't digest properly. So by eating grass you can actually die because it'll ball up and your body just can't digest it and it just sits there and and that's actually a com uh, common way of dying during uh, uh, famine I'm told. Don't quote me on that. Anyway, so the book talks about eating fried grass and that you can do it in times of famine. Ah. Uh, you know, the fact they do it in times of famine but don't do it in times that are good kind of indicates to me that it's probably not a good dietary choice. It's probably a desperate sort of choice. Because, for example, if you take if you take China, for example, uh, Chi Chinese people tend to eat a lot, a huge variety of animals and things, including, you know, like bats and stuff. 
And, you know, I've heard a lot of people make fun of that, and there's some derision about it and so forth. And I think people don't understand that China has been through some really terrible famines. And when a society goes through a terrible famine, they get a taste for some odd things because they have to eat those during times of really bad famine. And then the famine's over, and then they can tend to just keep on eating them. And that's what happened, you know, in China. But in this book that talks about only eating this fried grass in times of famine, which indicates to me it probably doesn't taste good, probably isn't very nutritious, and probably isn't a, isn't a very good staple. That's my ideas on that. But I was thinking it might be interesting if a village is having a rough time to have them frying up grass and see what the players think of that, if they would eat it, if, you know. Because a, a lot of this stuff, when I make a campaign where a lot of the interest for me is in watching the players react to the campaign world. I, uh, I enjoy it when my campaign world causes a degree of uh, uh, culture shock. I actually enjoy that. It's something I actually aim for because it's, it's kind of interesting and I learn, I learn about human nature from their reactions and they learn about you know themselves and 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 things from from that as well so i consider it sort of a mutual experience and i, I find it very gratifying in my campaign worlds uh another f thing that i found interesting was the idea like violence is so endemic to this culture that that uh, the author is writing about that it's considered just sort of a one of the natural forces around you. He actually goes out of his way to say that in, in one point. And so one of the interesting things about that kind of culture, which you could bring into a campaign world, is the idea that if you look at your attacker in the eye, if you catch their eye while they're brutalizing you, they'll probably kill you because it means you can now identify them. Love that. That's so interesting. That would be a really interesting thing to bring into into a campaign world, I think. You know, uh, you know, not necessarily D and D, but you know, a campaign world of some sort. Maybe traveler, maybe some kind of of uh, terrible planet where the where the players visit it, and it's just incredibly corrupt and violent and so forth. And you know, they might get that advice at a tavern or something. It would be a little hard for players to have to look away while they're getting, you know. Uh, uh, brutalize that's not going to fit into a game world very well but you could you could intimate it somehow you know the the bartender says it or something like that so and then the final thing and then i'll just wrap this up uh that i found really interesting it's got a great you know you find out what the house of hunger is at the end very very nice ending i love the ending of this book but one of the things i found interesting I won't. I won't tell you because I don't want to ruin it. It's just a. It's just a little book, so quick read. Uh, but one of the things I found interesting was uh, was the author says uh, sort of towards the end. I don't think this spoils anything. If it does, my apologies. But I don't think it does. But when you're talking, do you know who is talking? I love that idea. The idea of when you're talking, do you know who is talking? Now, now, what he's meaning is, or when you talk, do you just become the tin can transmitter of a sick society? Ah, oh, is that ever interesting, right? So how much of what you're saying is you and authentic thoughts, and how much are reflections and thoughts that were put there by your society? I have an idea that you... that. Thoughts are transmitted a hell of a lot more than they are original. I would expect I would expect thoughts are transmitted through your society and so forth, through your upbringing, through your learning and education, and so forth. I would say I would guess ninety nine percent of the time I would bet. But anyway, the idea of do you know who's talking? The idea of identifying the voice you're using, the voice that you're communicating with, insofar as you can. You know, there are different ways people think, right? Some some people have have thoughts that burst into their minds and they just sort of express those. Uh, some people take very careful time to construct their thoughts, present those. And there's always different ways of communicating, right? But I just thought that that was really interesting. 
idea to you know take a moment pause and think okay who's giving me these ideas who's transmitting these ideas like for example in this case obviously I'm trying to transmit the author's ideas am I doing it a good job of it I have no idea because it's also going to be through the lens of my own culture my own understanding my own mindset and my own reality but I think that that to an extent of course the author can transmit ideas to my mind and uh, well, it's one of the reasons I love reading I wouldn't read if I didn't believe that that was the case anyway thank you very much for watching this video if you uh, hung in there with me please leave comments I love to read comments if you have any ideas any thing you'd like to add to this if you've read this book and agree or disagree with with uh, what I've said about it uh, if I've missed anything uh, anything like that any kind of comments please leave them below and and uh, feel free to give me a like and don't forget to subscribe and all that good stuff and thanks for listening and uh, I will talk to you next time